Welcome everyone to our fall speaker series. I'm Joe Sinha, the CEO here at Peckham, and with me is Sarah George. To me, she's still Sarah Weiss, um, 20 okay. years later. Um, uh, with me is Sarah George, who's the Director of Mission Initiatives here at Peckham. So this is our first time gathering back in person since the pandemic, and it is so wonderful to see people in this room again. This is actually the first time we've had this many people in this setting since the pandemic. So it's great to see everyone here and thank you very much for coming. Uh, so as I said before, we do have a number of people who are with us um, virtual and thank you for those virtual people uh, for joining us today and we'll have another session this afternoon. I did wanna remind everyone that it's October which is National Disability uh, uh, Awareness Employment Month. And this year's theme is uh, disability, which is part of the equity equation. So in Michigan, for the last couple years, we've been having a conversation about the importance of integrating physical health and mental health. And our speaker here today um, it is a lot of the reason why those things are important. Part of the role that Peckham plays in uh, in that integration between physical and mental health is I always say there's a third um, part of that, and that's economic health, because it's pretty hard to have uh, good physical health and mental health um, without the uh, uh, funding that uh, uh, a job represents uh, to, to getting there. And so that's what Peckham does, is we believe in creating opportunities that people uh, uh, can help uh, them find their, their role, their career, uh, their pathway, and their economic independence. And um, one of the ways that we do that is through the Peckham Community Partnership Foundation, who has funded this speaker series event. But some of the other things that our, our foundation funds is the tools and the opportunity, the training programs, the human services uh, that we provide to folks to help them get over their barriers to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, Sarah George is with me here today. One of the um, programs that Sarah has been working on is something called I Strive to help people gain the necessary skills, the soft skills to help them make better decisions, to help them be able to uh, take advantage of those opportunities, to help teach them how to work with the barriers uh, and how to lower some of those barriers. Um, so your donations to the Peckham Community Partnership Foundation help create hope, opportunity, training and are for many people the difference um, between where they're at and where they're going to go. So I thank you all uh, and as you can tell I'm encouraging donations to the <laughs> to the Peckham Community Partnership Foundation. So um, we've been doing these speaker series now for more than a decade and this year we've really been focusing on um, how, how do we reach out? How do we create uh, equity in society, inclusion in society for everyone, for persons with disabilities, um, for persons who have, have um, uh, uh, faced systemic racism, for persons who don't have access to uh, the mental health or the um, physical health that they need? And part of our role here is to create that awareness um, here and uh, to uh, try to um, um, focus and highlight on the areas that we can as a community um, make a difference for people. So we are thankful to each of you for being here. We're thankful to the Peckham Community Partnership Foundation for being able to continually fund uh, these programs and services. And at that, I'm turning it over to Sarah to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Joe. And I'll echo Joe's sentiment that it's so wonderful to have people in the room 
So hello to everybody and to everybody virtual. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker today. And I promised our speaker, Wesley, that I would not over introduce and tell his story, that he gets to tell his story. So what I really want to do is tell you how we came to find Wesley. Uh, it was during the pandemic and I was streaming a lot of Netflix from my bed. And Queer Eye was the show that I was binging. And I happened to watch Wesley's episode, season four. If you want to go back and watch it, I highly recommend it. And I immediately started texting Siobhan, like, you have to watch this. You, you have to meet Wesley. We have to meet Wesley and bring him to Peckham. He's going to be perfect for the speaker series. And then, you know, the pandemic was happening. So a lot got jumbled in, in those years. And recently when we were talking about the reopening to the public, we thought about Wesley and how perfect he is to come here during National Disability Employment, Employment Awareness Month and how perfect he is to come and speak about his journey. What so moved me when I watched his episode without giving anything away <laughs> is that it's a story of transformation physically and I think even more than that, an internal transformation and a story about disability pride. So that is all I'm going to say. Let us off, let's offer Wesley Hamilton a very, very warm welcome. Oh. Thank you, thank you. Make sure this, all right. Thank you everybody for being here today. It is an honor to be able to speak with you. I try not to be so hard on you guys today. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. All right. <laughs> um, I get myself familiar a little bit with this clicker real quick. So a little, just give me a little time. I, I'm telling you it'll be real smooth in a second. Um, but no, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I, I had the opportunity of taking a tour of the space and just knowing the work that is being done within these walls is pretty amazing. I think it's impactful. I think that it, uh, I think a lot more people should know about it. Um, a lot of my work is trying to create opportunities for individuals and communities that I represent. And I see that being done a lot here. So I just wanted to really, you know, at least recognize that and make sure that everyone that is in this space understands that I see what is happening here and I hope that you know it is helping you grow into the best version of yourself and really finding your place in this world. Um, so yeah, so let's start with that then. All right, now I'm on this stage and I'm smiling and I'm happy if you don't, if you can't tell, right? Like, but I know you probably can't and I'm, I'm very full of life now, um, but I hadn't been full of life just growing up. To me, I, I knew that I would be dead or in jail by the age of 21. That's just, that was my reality. Um, and I like to start there because you might see somebody smiling today, but I wasn't always smiling. And, that, and, and something had to happen for me to really find that purpose in life and find that, that pride in, in my situation and my circumstances. So I'm born and raised on the east side of Kansas City, Missouri. A lot of us have a certain area of town where most people don't go. And that was the east side of KC for me. Um, the way I reference it is I was a product of my environment. My environment didn't go so far and that was all I saw. So anything around that environment is kind of what I started to try to be a part of. And that wasn't something positive. That wasn't something full of life or love or anything. It was all about survival. You were just trying to make it to the next day. And if I had my mindset made up that I was going to be dead or in jail by the age of 21, I wasn't trying to make it every day. I was doing anything and everything I could to probably just make that day the best day because my reality was is probably that was it. Now, like I said, I was never a happy person. So as you look at visually, you look at these pictures. This is me at growing up as a teenager. All I had was pictures of flipping the camera off. So my apologies. <laughs> but that but that was me. It was a negative mindset. The reason why I like to show them pictures is because that is completely different than who I am today. Right. Take it off because I, you know, pictures middle finger up. We don't want to look at it all day. Anyway, visually, you got a chance to see that. So let me break down. Why did I have that mentality? 
Why did I look like that person that you were able to see just a few minutes ago? And it's all because I didn't have leadership when I was growing up. I didn't have the right representation when I was growing up. A lot of us are focused on the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation now. Well, when I was growing up, I'm, I'm, I was born in the 80s. I'm 88, baby baby, right? And so I always tell people around that time for Black Americans, it was very hard. It was very hard. And, and when you think of representation, it wasn't a positive representation being instilled into individuals like me. So growing up in the school system and everyone already looking at me like maybe I was an enemy of the state, there was no elevation. There wasn't anyone. And then hold on. When we talk about representation, if there's not a positive model of what I represent out there, then the people that are trying to teach me to be more can only limit me to what they see. And if they couldn't find representation for me, then all they were going was off of their own perceptions and opinions of who I was supposed to be in this world. So now I'm here to kind of help each and every one of you understand that we all have a different identity. And once we embrace that identity, we can create the reality that we want. We don't have to look for it for other, from other people. Well, when I was growing up, that's what I was searching. I didn't have individuals in my life that said, you know what, this is my identity, I own it. But my identity speaks empathy, love, kindness, awareness, self-love. Right. Because it's not just about love. It's about how much you see yourself. How are you looking in a mirror and what is that? How do you feel about that image? Because if you don't love yourself, you're not going to be in this world loving anybody else. And if you don't love yourself, how can you believe in yourself? And if everybody around you is believing in you, but you don't believe in yourself, then obviously you're not going to give yourself any value. So for me, I didn't believe in myself. Everybody around me did. Well, it didn't work. I didn't love myself, so when everybody was giving me love, I was showing off hate. Again, let me just go right back to the pictures, right? Especially for people that just came in. So you can understand, I was full of hate. I always look at my pictures now and then literally, I, I don't even see myself anymore. But that was me, right? Like that was really me. And so, I didn't die or, or go to jail at 21. What happened was I ended up having a beautiful little girl. My daughter, Neve. Oh, yeah, right? That's how I feel. This was, this was, <laughs> this was a while back. And <laughs> she laughs at me about this. But I show these pictures because this is the innocent little girl. My daughter's 13 now. So it's not a lot of, oh, it's like, I feel you now. I got you, right? <laughs> but this is, this is where things change for me. Now, you see me in a wheelchair and I'll get to that story in a minute, but right now we're gonna talk about a story where I was able in this world. I was walking around just like anyone else. I thought I had an opportunity just like anyone else, but I limited myself because of how I was seen by everyone else. As a black man in America, it's hard. And me growing up on the east side of Kansas City with no representation, well, it, it was definitely harder for me. I had this little girl that came from nowhere. Like I just, I didn't even expect to be a father. When she was born, I was, I was going into the age of 22. Me and her mom wasn't on the best of terms. So what I did, I wanted to be the best father I could be. I didn't have my father in my life. So I, I, I took up to try to get custody. Um, fortunately, the, the judge, you know, he granted me full custody. I didn't know I was going to give sole custody of this little girl. I wasn't ready, right? Like, I wasn't ready to be a father. I thought, I, let, let's just do this half and half thing. And, and no, the judge like, no, nah, man, you ready? I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, but I didn't know how much this was going to change my life. And what I'm, what I'm here to say is that you don't need, like, this little girl in your life to, for things to be changed. But what, what I'm, part of this story is, being able to recognize when people speak life into you that just care about you. Because sometimes we are getting, people speak life into us every day. But if we don't pay attention to those moments, then we find ourselves being defeated the rest of our lives. And so I was literally defeated just mentally. I hadn't even had anything happen to me physically yet, but just by my upbringing, there was not a, a drive to be more. 
So I go, I'm, I got this little girl. So I'm like, okay, I got to be a full-time father now. I got to do what's right. I, I went and got a good job. And I was really just trying this parenting thing out. I didn't understand like what, what this, this, this whole, you know, you gotta, you gotta be this father and what that process was going to give me. But what I did know was that this little girl was going to change my life forever. I was going on my, it was five days after my 24th birthday. My daughter just going on two. I had a verbal altercation. I got shot multiple times in my abdomen. Led me, caused me to have a spinal cord injury. I like to be very particular about my injury just because every wheelchair user is not the same. So um, for me, having a spinal cord injury left me paralyzed from the waist down, which means I have no mobility past my level of injury. So when you have a spinal cord injury, just give you a breakdown, whatever, level of your spinal cord is impacted is where your your motion and feeling probably will stop so you have individuals that are from the neck down for me i am probably mid-range by my waist okay so just so you can kind of understand that life was life became hard for me right like i i'm, I'm paralyzed and I, I don't go so much into the story but just to believe when i got shot i thought i was dead I didn't think I was waking up the next day. Um, I was actually in a position, I was there with my best friend. Um, and I remember looking at him and just saying like, hey man, I'm about to die. He's like, yeah, you are. Like there was no hope. There was no hope. That was our reality. Like why would we have give each other hope when we all probably believed that we would be dead earlier than, you know, everybody else. Like growing up in, again, black America is just different. And a lot of us don't see individuals 60, 70, 80 years old. And it's a lot, and even other minority groups as well. You know, just lifespans are different. So I didn't never dream of being an old man. I just dreamed of just living. Didn't know when that was going to end. So being shot, yeah, life is over for me. But it wasn't. I woke up in a hospital and I found out that I was disabled. <laughs> funny when I think about that term I'll tell you a little bit but I entered a new world that I had no knowledge over so here's the accountability piece because I want you to understand I represent you know the disabled community I do a lot of work but I had to understand where I where my thought process was for people living with disabilities before I acquired mine and at the age of 24 I had no knowledge of really the disabled community so me entering this world was foreign to me and I didn't understand it and I didn't accept it. Why didn't I accept it? It's because if it wasn't put on the forefront for me to actually acknowledge it growing up my whole life, then I, I thought it was an issue. So that just led to more depression, a lot of self-hate, no love for my image at all. And then I focused on how people saw me. And I became more debilitated by their thoughts and opinions of how they thought I was supposed to live. Like everyone that sees me in a wheelchair already see the limitation. So that's what was pushed on me every day. I was pushed because I was limited. On top of that, I was overweight. I'm five, four, five, five on a good day. <laughs> you see how I kind of pause, right? <laughs> Depending on what shoes I got on. Anyway. But at the time I injured, I was 250 pounds though. I was overweight and I had always been overweight my whole life. I, I joke about it, but I thought Big Bondy was a real thing. <laughs> and I love that we can all joke, but here's the reality. When you live in food deserts, when you don't have proper health care, when you don't have gyms and institutions in your area, you're going to accept the things that you don't think you can change. There was no physical activity being done outside of my community. So I went into the things that was being done outside of my community, which led to me having a mindset, which ultimately led to my fate. So I was worthless. I felt worthless. Again, you see a picture of me flipping the camera off. That's the first couple of years of me being in a wheelchair. So just again, just because I got in a wheelchair don't mean my mindset changed. 
I was still the same person I was when I got shot. I still thought about the same things. And yes, I was a father and I was going to make things happen for my daughter. Doesn't mean I had changed my ways completely. But the difference for me was is that I was trying to go back and fit into a world that I really wasn't a part of anymore. Trying to normalize something that wasn't normal really just allowed me to be defeated. Let me go back. So one of my favorite quotes, right, is you can never allow a single, never confuse a single defeat with a final defeat. This is the first time I really felt defeated. I didn't look at any adversity in my life like a defeat before. It's crazy. I didn't think about the way I, you know, the school system, the way I was brought up, like none of that. None of it was a defeat for me because it was a reality for me. It was something that had been happening generation after generation. So by it happening to me, it was fine. Even the fact that when I, I accepted being shot and thought I was going to die was, again, a reality. I lost my first friend at 13. So for me, it was a reality. And other friends started dropping after that. So why am I any different? Why should life be any different for me? Well, I didn't I didn't allow that defeat to be my only defeat. This is where I this is where the change happens, right? So I always I go into this thing of like the new you. Because in order for you to change your ways, you have to re rebirth yourself into something different. You have to think different. You have to move different. You have to live different. Your perception is your reality. So if you're having the same thoughts that you had the night before, you would think the same way. You would do the same things. In order to shift that change, you have to shift yourself in the way you think. And so it's big on reinventing yourself. And I was, I was at a point where because I was overweight, because I was dealing with, you know, this disability, it put me on to something. Well, I just had serious health complications. I got on bed rest. I was on bed rest for 21 hours a day um, for two years. Now, when I got shot, it was 2012, January. I love my timeline just because for the next two to three years, I was going through all these surgeries. My last, my last surgery was January 2015, just so you know. So when I show you this amazing story, because right now we just got the little, we got the hard part, but you ain't even got to the good part. And when I show you the good part, understand it's only been six years. It's only been six years. So that means when we get there, anything that's happening today can completely change once you change your mind. That's just what it is. And I get to be the example of that truth. So when I talk about reinventing yourself, 21 hours a day, I was, I was in a bed. The doctor told me the only way I could heal my body was protein. If I'm telling you that I thought I was big boned and I didn't understand food back then, I didn't understand protein when the doctor was talking to me. I remember they started giving me drinks um, and some people might know one of them. And one of them was called Insure. And so for me, my grandmother drunk it and I'm like 26 at this time. And I'm like, ah, I can't. This is how life going to be, you know, like, um, and again, it's the mindset, right? Because I wouldn't mind drinking one now for the protein it has, okay? <laughs> but back then, I was like, oh, man, I just feel more and more debilitating. Um, and, you know, you could get a proper food guideline, but if you don't know how to grocery shop for the right foods and things like that, it's not going to help you. Um, and I didn't want to drink this drink. So I, I enrolled in a local community college and I took took up a dietitian course and I ain't I, I, I ain't finished. So I ain't become like a professional dietitian just so anyone want to know because um, I get that question all the time. But what happened was that once I opened that book on food, I fell in love with it because I had never understood food to that moment. And I mean, at this time, I'm dealing with a lot. I'm, I'm you know, I got my surgeries. I'm on all these different meds like my mind is juggling all these different feelings and emotions but i'm looking at this food and i'm like man let me try it let me just try this thing out if i want to be more right like if i want to be more than my situation right now i need to do something different to get myself out of this situation so when i started looking i remember the first thing that caught my eye was how much 
sugar was in soda. And I, if you drink it, I'm, I'm not telling you it's bad, but I'm telling you it's bad. Um, <laughs> and it was just, when you have that visual, sometimes I would hope most people would see like, all right, maybe it's, that's enough. Maybe I can take my time on that. And that was me. I'm like, oh man, if that's how my sugar is in my drink, then this water don't look too bad right now. And so if you ever want to know some of, some of my transformation, the biggest thing was water. Because when I started putting water in my body, water changed a lot. It flushed out all the toxins. It kept me hydrated. Like I never thought of the bad thoughts I had because my body was dehydrated. Because my mind wasn't really mentally sane because I wasn't, you know, putting the right nutrients inside of me, right? Like all of these things brought value. So I started to just change things up. And I wasn't really properly on like this full diet. That happened later on in life. But at this time, I'm like, okay, let me just change certain things. I went from starchy foods to, you know, wheat or something like that. I, again, you just go through, how can I substitute this food for that food? And Pinterest was my best friend. So because I was on bed for 21 hours a day, I, I would watch the Food Network too. So I'm like a great cook. Like I'm an amazing cook. And all of it came from the Food Network. I never went nowhere else. I just laid in the bed every day and I just washed it. I bought all the utensils they used. And then I, when I had three hours, I would go in the kitchen and I would cook. And that would be the meals that I would eat. And uh, yes, I had a little bit more discipline because I was in the bed. That means I couldn't get up and go into the snack drawer, none of that, right? So it did allow me discipline. So I just wanted to throw that out because sometimes we do we do fault ourselves for bad habits, but we just got to get those habits and remove them out of our space. So that was my next thing. Well, I don't want none of this in my house because if it's not in my house, then the only thing that's in my house is going to be the things that's good for me. So when I talk about reinventing yourself, I go through these different steps and I'm just going to just run through them real quick because again, these are steps that I, I, I do now. These are part of my daily routine, but these are the things that really help me heal myself, love myself and be a better version of myself. And nobody else had to do it for me. So that's why I'm showing this with you. So the first thing was gratitude, journaling. A lot of people don't think about taking five minutes out of your morning and journaling or even expressing gratitude. Again, most of us wake up with the same thoughts we had when we went to sleep. And so we hated life when we went to sleep. Well, life ain't going to be better when we wake up. But if we wake up and talk about gratitude, if we go to sleep and say, you know what? Today was a little bit hard, but man, I'm grateful for the experiences that life has taught me. Perception is our reality. You wake up in the morning being grateful that you got the opportunity to do it. And again, I have the opportunity to try again. Thank you. It's just that simple. Like we can't have we can't have gratitude just for waking up. I'm only sharing that because I've had many circles where I've had people go around and say, tell me one thing you're grateful for and everybody's stuck. It's like, are we that unknown to our reality that we can't find one thing to be happy for because we're looking at all the adversity life gives us? Every day I woke up and despite being hooked up to all these systems and cords and doctors coming in and when I had to go through the hospital, I had six surgeries and they were all bad. But every day I was grateful to be up. I was grateful that I had another opportunity. That was my very first thing, understanding gratitude. I was never grateful when I was growing up. I thought everybody owed me something. Why well, should I be happy with life when this person should be giving me everything in life, right? I, that's how it should be. And that's not what it was. So every day I woke up and I was grateful. I was grateful that I had this little girl. I still I have custody of my daughter. So of course she's in another room while I'm facing defeat which I had to change that story within myself and start saying like, how can I be grateful for my position? Like I have to find some way to be happy about this life. The first thing was that I'm, I'm still here with my daughter. That was it. I'm grateful that I'm here for her. I'm here with her, right? 
So the next thing outside of gratitude, and there is a thing that I recommend if anyone looks it up, it's called a five minute journal. And so uh, it takes you through all the steps. You wake up in the morning, you write two things that you're grateful for. You follow it up with some affirmations. I'll give you a few examples in a second. And then uh, following that night, you go back, you write five, you know, write the entry again. What could have made today great? And I think it's an affirmation after that as well. And I could be stumbling, but the whole process is if you give yourself about five minutes in the morning, five minutes at, in the evening to decompress, to really just go back and reflect on your day, then you won't wake up in the morning with those worries that you went to sleep with. You let you released it. Most of us don't release the pain that we dealt with from the day before. So that pain becomes something hard for us every day. The next thing I want to tell you, of course, my next one, I'm going down. So next one is like eat good food, which I broke it down to you. So I always feel like health is wealth. You want to be wealthy, you got to be healthy. That's it. Because it, once you have a clear mind, you'll create the reality. And I'm not, when I speak of wealth, I'm not always talking about money. There's richness in everything. There's richness in the earth. When you figure that out, you have more power than most people because you don't need most things to give you that peace. And there's nothing going to be tied to it besides your own awareness because you feel good inside out. That means your physical body doesn't even matter anymore. Because once you start feeling good, I mean, we've heard stories, right? Of people that have more limitations than me doing powerful things. It's because they feel good from the inside out. And that's what they're bringing out. Their body becomes a vessel. And when you understand that, then the materialistic things that we're doing to mask ourselves don't matter no more. Because if something like this happens to you, that mask, it's not, it, it doesn't matter anymore, right? My whole life I had a mask on. And then I had something that was permanent. This is a permanent mask for me that I had to find a way to embrace. See, I could have been like any and everybody trying to fit in. And then this happens to me and now I got to stand out. There's no mask going on my face anymore. So next one, of course, practice gratitude. I got to oh, practice positivity. I'm a very positive person. You hear it a lot. You can't be positive every day. Positivity is a choice. And the way that you react to your adversity in life is a choice. And you could think of a situation in a, neg a negative way, or you could look at it from a positive outlook. Again, it's up to you. Most people get mad at traffic. I get excited. That's time to read a book. I like, seriously. Like, I mean, look, I stay in Kansas City, but I also stay in LA now. And LA has a lot of traffic. And for me, every time I'm in LA traffic, I turn on an audio book. I listen to a podcast. You telling me that while I'm in this moment that I have no control over, I can grow, I can elevate. I don't have to listen to negative music and things like that that's going to alter my mind. I'm going to do things that help me elevate. So then by the time that hour goes in, I go into that room or that meeting, I'm like a whole different person. And they're like, man, you was just stuck in tra oh, traffic was the best thing. It did so much for me this last hour. Everybody else over there complaining. They didn't get that. I'm like, man, I even got a chance to order my Starbucks and pick it up. You know, like everybody in line waiting. I'm just going inside like, thank you. Right. Again, you get to change the way you think about things when you give your t yourself time and avoid the distractions. So positivity is a choice and you don't might not find it in every day. But. If you make your mind up, you can always come back and have a positive outlook to a negative situation. And I'll break that down in a second. So reading. I didn't start reading until I was 27. And I tell people all the time, the streets might have made me, but books freed me. Now, anything that you want to ask me, I'm going to have a book as a reference. Because I want, I, I always feel like I'm a plug connected to the source. And if I'm reading books every day and I'm educating myself, that means the knowledge that I have right here, I'm probably have a source for you. I'm not going to tell you anything that I don't believe and I'm not going to tell you anything that hasn't helped me change my life. So again, reading is fundamental. 
I, it's not a joke, but when I grew up and the reason why it took me to about the age of 27 is because there was a saying that said, you know, you want to hide something from a black man, put it in a book. That was my reality. And, that, and most people probably done heard that saying. But for me, that I thought that was real. When I grew up, I embodied every stereotype that I heard. Okay? You tell me I'm not supposed to open a book? Cool. Not for me. Tell me I'm supposed to live in the streets? That's where I'm going to go. You want to let me watch these TV and these movies that influence me a different way? Cool. That's, I guess that's the only leadership I have. All right? So understand that that mindset was me. But then I get to change that. All right, I'm going to go speed it up. So time management. I'm big on time management, y'all. Most people say they don't have time in the day to do anything. I'm in a wheelchair. I have to add extra time in the day to do everything. And I still do more things than most people. That says a lot. I wake up at 4 a.m. Most people, when they hear me say I wake up at 4 a.m., I'm like, oh, wow. It's not like I wake up at 4 a.m. because I have to. I wake up at 4 a.m. because I want to. I get to take initiative of my day. I get to give myself time to take care of myself before I give myself to everybody else. Understand that. If you wake up early enough to focus on you, you'll be a better version when you give you to everybody else because energy is real. And when you start consuming energy, if you have not built your wall up first, that energy can defeat you. So for those people waking up at 750, got to be somewhere by 830. I'm telling you, it's not, it's not, it's not working. I'm telling you, you need a good hour. You need a good hour to be at peace with yourself. You need a good hour to understand that today might be full of adversity, but I am in control. If you don't even speak those things to yourself, then the way you go outside, the first thing that happens is traffic and you're already upset. And then after that, now everybody else has to feel your energy because you didn't understand how to set the tone for yourself at the beginning of the day. Time management is only important if you want a better life. Accountability, exercise, and doing the things you love. Accountability is one of those things that everybody is to blame of all your mistakes in your life until you realize that you're the only one to blame. And again, that's the hard part because I've been in situations where I wanted to blame everybody else. And, bl and once I found a way to take accountability, understand my place in this situation, I was able to free myself from so much. And it allows people not to have power over me. So sometimes accountability is just like, yeah, you know what? I have to be at fault that I even went into that room. I have to be at fault that I got myself into that cab. Like when we go out the door, we make a choice. That's, we have to be accountable of that. When we stay in the house, we making a choice. We have to be accountable of that. Now we could say we're staying in the house because outside is just ruthless, but it's still a choice for us. And once we become accountable, we're not saying, well, I'm staying in the house because all of them don't want me out there. No, you're staying in the house because you're staying in the house. You can, you can change things, but you're not in control of everybody else. Like, I don't control how people see me. I had a great motivational speech with my daughter last night. <laughs> and, one of, and one of the things was, was just basically, like, I, I know that people see me different. I know it. Every day I go out, I know it. I know that there will be times where accessibility isn't there for me. But that's me. But by me going out, I am opening myself up to that adversity and then creating my own reality by the way I want to see myself. It's not about how people see you. It's about how you see you and that's how it changes the world. Because if we don't understand our identity, what happens is you're like the next person, then the next person's like you, then the next person is like you. Nobody's the same. No, everybody's the same. Nobody's different. So when you hear references speaking to a group of people, that's because that group of people haven't shared the things that make them so unique and different. Instead, we're all like who we hang around. And do the things you love. All right. So at, at the end of the day, no matter what you're doing in life, you have to do something that you love. Because that should bring you peace and joy. Rather, for me, I love reading. So. 
Every time I have an opportunity, I'm listening to a book. I was even listening to a book while I was here right here. I take it out of my ear. Like, oh man, I said I got my AirPod on. Like, that's me though. I'm a student. I, I reference myself as a student of life. That means that I can learn from everything. It's not one thing I'm not willing to learn. I even learn from people that look at me different. That's how powerful it is when you can be open minded, right? So I share this because all these things help me take control of my life. You sh I, I showed you who I was, I showed you the evil West. You see the person on, on the stage today, right? Well, once I took control of my life, I became an award winning adaptive athlete that competed all over the country in bodybuilding and CrossFit. All this happened after I became paralyzed, after everyone told me that the odds were stacked up against me, that becoming a product of my environment would literally create something that would debilitate me the rest of my life. And instead, I became something more powerful than I ever believed I could be. I never even thought I could be this person. And when this happened to me, trust and believe, there wasn't even drive to be different. I had become accustomed to what people perceived my life to be. Most people saw limitations once I had this limitation, and that's what they put on me. I embodied everybody's thoughts about me until I started to change my own about myself. When I took myself out the victim mentality, when I removed the why me, right? Like the why me? Why did this happen to me? Everybody else around me is so normal. <laughs> What's normal, right? For me, it was when you change the story, you can change your reality. My story is that I was walking back to my car. I was shot multiple times. I was paralyzed by it. The person that shot me, I never even talked to. Never met him a day in my life. First time seeing him was the first time when I looked at the barrel of the gun. All right. So I changed the story. This is where the power of affirmations come in. And before I share my affirmation, Muhammad Ali says it best. He says it's the it's the constant repetition of affirmations that leads to belief. And once that belief becomes a true conviction, things begin to happen. You have to believe the things you speak into yourself for your reality to change. So I used to say, and I still say it to the day, but I'll tell you more profound things in a minute. So the man that tried to take my life gave me life. That's what I would tell myself every day. Because every day, this person right here was living life. Why would I be mad? Now, trust to believe I had this revengeful heart when I first got injured. But I also had to take care of myself and my daughter, so I had to put that on a back burner. Well, once I started to change, and of course, I went through a level of defeat. I went through all this process. But by January 2016 was the first time I had my, my very first bodybuilding competition. And I went and competed for several years after that. So now with that being said, my next thing is experience is the teacher that owes no favors. When I talk about representation, I understood after a while that I was going to be that person that most people would be able to look at now and see life differently for themselves. I started my nonprofit organization. It's called Disabled But Not Really. Our whole goal is to just help people know that they are more than their circumstances. I'm big on identity. I want to know who you are when you come into our space. I don't, want, I don't want you to think that I know you because you could be something more amazing than what I perceive you to be. We work in health and wellness. We do things when it comes to physical activity, especially in the gym. As you see, I'm pretty, pretty jacked, right? <laughs> I only teach people the things that I know. That's enough for me. If I can help you get in the gym, no matter your disability, I've learned a long time ago is that a lot of us, when we have disabilities, we think we're limited. We have some type of limitation. For me, I, I can't walk. So when I started climbing ropes in a wheelchair, I had overcame that. I didn't need to walk. Most people with legs can't even climb the rope. So for me, I knew I was more powerful than what people saw. So I give people that power in the places that we're at. 
It doesn't matter. I've seen people that are visually impaired get, you know, overly excited when they were able to do burpees because they understood their range. It's so many things that can happen when you challenge yourself mentally and you surpass those mental limitations. So my biggest thing is we want to help you push past your mental limitations because everything is mental. And when you can believe that you are more, you start to become more. And again, it does. you don't need all the abilities of the physical body to become something more powerful than the physical body. It's all about your mind. And when you do that, you change. So, of course, I just kind of give you a quick overview. I'm always on the front line, like I said. <laughs> I'm there with the people that we serve. I just, it's a beautiful thing to really see people of all different disabilities really just pushing themselves. And I get to be there to, to help and lead and guide. Be the change you wish to see in the world. As I shared earlier, a lot of us don't have representation. Well, why can't you be it? That's it. No, I'll just play it. But, <laughs> but seriously, like a lot of us are looking for someone else when maybe that is us. It's just that profound for us to understand the power we have, how we can shift the world and, and change it if there is a problem that we feel a solution can be created. For me, I knew that I wanted to see my body differently. I knew that everybody else would see my body differently. So once I started to embrace my differences, I started to love myself. When I started to love myself, I became more. When I became more, I started to do more. When I started to do more, I understood that I was going to shift the world and the change that I wanted to shift it. So when you become the change you wish to see in the world, you become a positive representation that you never even believe you could be. I've reached stages and been on platforms that young 21-year-old West would have never thought he could make it to. The things and accomplishments I've made and even the stuff that I still keep doing today. Like I was just in Canada last week. And it's crazy because I never even thought I'd be on an airplane before my injury. And all I do is travel now. I travel all over the world. I, I went mountain biking. It was a, it threw a forest, a rainforest at that. And I didn't even think that was a, a thing. Like when I was there, I'm like, man, this is like on a movie. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what movie I've seen this stuff because it was so mind blowing. But again, when you become a student of life, as I reference myself, you are so willing to explore because there are so many things you don't know. I learned so much from a culture that was different than mine. Everybody out there was nice. Like I had never met so many people so nice. Like I've met people that are nice, but I mean, everywhere you go, they're nice. I'm like, man, everybody had the Chick-fil-A attitude. <laughs> like, it was just so authentic. You know, I'm like, are you sure you never mad? But it was just that type of thing to allow me to understand that we don't have to allow our daily situations to really create a negative mindset, right? That's what we can do. So before I end, I want to share the power of forgiveness because again, I believe that that's the main piece of my story. Now, when I, when I spoke my affirmations in the sense of the man that was trying to take my life, gave me life, I was already forgiving myself for that situation. I had already forgiven him. For me to see something better meant that I couldn't see something worse than the position I was in. So, Queer Eye, and I ended with this one. So Queer Eye was an amazing show, season four, episode two. I had to throw that out. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. If you really want to understand my story, they really put emphasis on it. Be open-minded when you watch because you're going to learn a lot of things from the show. But the biggest thing for me was that I did get a chance to meet the man that shot me, and I did it on national television. So I'm not going to sit up here and tell you one thing and then go out and live my world and not let that person know. See. So we sat across from each other and very authentic, organic, nothing scripted. Couldn't be scripted if you know where I come from. <laughs> um, and in the process of me hearing why he did it, which was common, instantly I already knew if the shoe was on the other foot, I would have did the same thing. 
because of the mindset I had back then. So in a moment of looking or being asked, do I, do I, would I like forgiveness? And would I like an apology? National TV, season four, episode two, just so you know, probably even a clip on YouTube, said, no, I don't want no apology. I want to tell you thank you. Because if, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't know who I am. And that's more powerful to me than me having a physical disability due to my actions and emotions that played a part to your reaction of doing this to me. That's that accountability piece. And when we can understand that even the small reaction that we have toward things can cause a bigger reaction to someone else, well, we can't be a victim to a circumstance. And I wasn't a victim no more. But I need y'all to understand that. So while you're listening to my story, in order for me to be who I am, I had to believe that I could be that. I had to see myself differently than the way everybody else saw me. And then I had to forgive myself for all the things and the way my life had been and forgive those that I felt had maybe harmed me. But give them gratitude because I had found my place in this world by the adversity that they put me through. And when you can understand that you are such a more powerful being than the circumstances that you're living in, then the reality of life for you starts to change. The reality of life for you starts to be what you dream it to be. If we are all what we perceive and our reality is a perception of that, then you might as well perceive yourself to be something beautiful, amazing, and determined to be the best version of yourself. So thank you guys. My name is Wesley Hamilton. I appreciate you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Wesley. We do have a little time for some questions, and so um, we have t over 280 folks online watching. Was there an aha moment that shifted you from a victim to a victor, or was it more of a process? Oh. I like that question. Okay. <clears throat> All right, it's two parts to that. It was definitely a process. <laughs> it was a process. And that that slide of me taking control of your life was my process. My aha moment, which I waited to the question, didn't know that was gonna be a question, but I felt like it was. Okay, my aha moment. That's where I talk about my daughter and, and, and having somebody that speaks life into you. So while I was going through my bed rest, I remember one day after a regular checkup at the doctor office, my daughter had to be with me. And as I was hop, hopping back in my chair, because I hop, I do hop. <laughs> as I hop back into my wheelchair, my daughter looked at my wheelchair and this is what she referenced it as. She said, well, daddy, are you about to get in your Superman chair again? <laughs> that was the aha moment. Because in my whole life, no matter what I have been facing, all the adversity, poverty, whatever, nobody spoke life into me where it made me feel like I have more strength and power outside of my circumstances. My daughter gave me that. And so every day I believed that I could be that. Now I'm a Batman fan. <laughs> Let y'all know I like the black cape. But I wore that cape proudly for my daughter and I still do. And that's what gave me that strength of that athlete that you saw. That's what gave me that power, was that my daughter spoke life into me when all I saw was weakness. And I understood that words are powerful. We just got to understand when we hear them, how we start to embody them, embrace them, and then live to that truth. Thank you. Who was your favorite person on Queer Eye to work with? <laughs> um, actually, I think all of them were um, equally great for me. And that's just because I had already came on that show. If you watch, ever watch the show, it's a, they do a lot of helping people become who they are and changing things in their life. For me, I felt like I was already at a hill state. And by being at a hill state, I was more open-minded and wanted to know how they made it to their hill state. And I think we all started to work hand in hand. And so each person gave me value and gave me more understanding, not only of who they are, but why they have embraced who they are to be open in a world that even perceives them as something different. 
How did you take care of your daughter when you were on bed rest for 21 hours a day? Did you have a support system to help you during that time? My mom's my backbone. <laughs> you know, she always tells me like, as long as she's here, I got her. And so at, at that time, my mom was my backbone, but my mom was also my fence. So I did have times where I, I lashed out. I did have times where I was angry, but my mom, allowed herself to be that wall instead of me pushing all that hate on everybody else. So my mom helped me on that end, as well as making sure that my daughter was good. If you could go back, would you want the situation to happen differently? Then I wouldn't have the life I have. <laughs> Honestly, I, I would never regret the way my life went because that allows me to now go into rooms and relate to so many. And if I look at my purpose in life, I think the life that I live was supposed to happen. And so, no, I would never go back. I would just live it the same way. You are truly amazing and an inspiration to everyone. How, how is your sweet, strong mama and does she ever travel with you and see how you <laughs> help lift others after all you two have been together? been through together. I love that. Um, my, my first year of my journey of like getting into like being an athlete and speaking, my mom and my daughter was traveling with me everywhere. Um, after that, I started doing more work in my city where they, they come and volunteer and participate and help out there as much as when I go travel. Now, as being a student of life, I find that since I travel a lot for work, I go and I kind of learn about the those places and then we plan family trips so we can all go and embrace the beauty that life offers. Nice. So you talk a lot about learning and reading. One of the questions is what is the number one book you recommend? Oh, good one. Because it's already on top of my head. <laughs> How to Own Your Own Mind by Napoleon Hill. <laughs> How to Own Your Own Mind by Napoleon Hill. All right. You talked about accountability. What advice would you give to a person that always tries to take the blame for everything to lessen pain for others? Well, how much are you putting pain on yourself? Because if you aren't allowing others to take accountability and you become in that wall or that vessel for them, then he eventually we break too. And that's when we have to check on our strong friends, right? So don't always be the strong friend as much as the friend with awareness and allow people to be accountable. It starts with a conversation. All my friends know, friends, family, all of them know, I'm not, I'm not consuming their negative energy. I'm not consuming it. But what I will do is help guide them, talk to them, and as well just listen. So just because you're listening sometimes doesn't mean that you have to actually take in what people are dealing with um, and understand that your mental health matters and being becoming that individual that is taking all of that in at least for me it wouldn't be it wouldn't be healthy for me so just make sure that you are you are being accountable for yourself accountable for your own energy and awareness of who you are and allowing yourself to give your give that moment of healing and time if you want to consider being that wall, that fence for other people. What kind of advice would you have for young people who find it hard to view themselves positively or their circumstances? Again, my motivational speech to my daughter last night. <laughs> we're in a whole different school and so we're just learning. Um, like I, uh, you know, as a, when I was growing up, I know the influences of life and I know how hard it is, especially nowadays, young people got social media. I'm on it too. But you need to understand what you, what you want out of life. When you understand what you want out of life, you start doing the things you need to do to create that reality for yourself. That's my advice to any and everybody is that you need to understand what you want out of life. If you want to be a better person, you'll work to be better once you make your mind up. It's hard. 
but understand that we are who we are who who we are around we become that so if you want to become more than your circumstances look at the people that you hang yourself around because i have never met somebody that's been around someone at an elevated state and not grew right but i've, I've definitely been around a lot of people at a lower state of mind and we all stayed the same so again make the conscious decision to be able to see yourself differently surround yourself by people that you actually want to identify as and if any if all of that is hard because <laughs> it is I'm, I'm sure just growing up right then just start to speak affirmations speak some type of power and life into yourself that allows you to be more than what you feel and what you see because your, your the words that you use will become your reality if you speak with them with intent Thank you. What would you say looking back is more limiting for you now? Was it your old mindset or your physical limitation? What's more difficult? I always, you know, like for me, I always say like, and there's different ways that I, I reference it, but for people, I would say I was disabled mentally before I became physically. And with that, I look at it from a place of the 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 limitation society perceives of me, what I can and cannot do, and how much I did not do prior to my injury. So I wouldn't I would say that it was it was more my mindset than everything. Because if I had changed my mindset, I could have okay. One of my favorite quotes is if I could change my thoughts, I could change the world. And so that's truly what I believe. Because if I had could have focused on my mindset back then, my reality would have been so much different. And so now my physical body really, again, my physical body don't bother me. I tell people that every day. You know, if there's if there's a place I can't go, that's because it wasn't for me. I go where I'm celebrated. Elevators. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? A little bit of accessibility around. That's me, you know, and if it doesn't have that, then I, I don't feel any way about it. It doesn't it doesn't bother me. So my physical body has nothing over what my mind can create. You spoke earlier about um, from a DEI perspective, like the difficulties uh, that black Americans face, specifically black men. Can you talk a little bit about the intersectionality of now also being a black man who also has a disability and maybe what that experience has been like for you or how you even advocate in that space no that's good i got a lot of videos where i talk about this just because it's situations that come up sometimes i don't know if i'm being discriminated against because i'm black or because i'm disabled i ride around in nice cars and stuff like that i try to make myself feel i like to do whatever i want to do let me put it like that. So if I feel like if there's a will, there's a way, right? <laughs> See what I did there. <laughs> um, but but with that, I've learned that a lot of people don't understand the intersection. So just because I, I, I can't just be a disabled man, I have to be a black and disabled man because the the way I was brought up, the cultures, the things that happen to black Americans happens to me. The things that happen to dis disabled Americans happens to me because I'm a part of both communities, but I can't be separated. And I do find that in advocacy and work that a lot of people, when they think of dis people with disabilities, they just put you in one community. And it's like, well, if we all represent something different, we could have religious beliefs we could be from different backgrounds and cultures that that intersection is important because that also speaks on what you represent so a lot of times i do go out and i say i'm a bl i'm black and disabled but I, I allow that emphasis to be first because even within most communities they'll only see you for the things that you represent which for me is disability so my work in the black community is focused on how they can see disabled bodies too so I don't I don't leave nobody I don't let nobody slide mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I do know that there's a lot of work to be done because I, I 
because the intersections are important of the identity of the individual, not what makes that individual, right? And so my disability doesn't make me. What makes me is the way I was brought up, the way I live my life, the culture, the things. Like when I get out, I listen to certain music. When I do things, like that's me. That's how I was brought up. And so understanding that can also understand the people that you're around. But when you put people in one group, then you're thinking everybody, because they're part of that group, they're supposed to be the same. And that's, again, it goes just back into disability. Every wheelchair user is not the same. So having to be able to put emphasis on that will create understanding, right? Like, and so best thing I could say is have an empathetic heart. Because once you have an empathetic heart, you could create an understanding for the intersections of the person that you only visually perceive. So just because they're black, don't perceive them just being black. They could represent so many more amazing things that you have yet to understand until you have a conversation with them. And that's the power of the intersections. Thank you. We have time for one more question and then a, a comment. The question is, is there a faith element to your success? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think when I was going through the hospital, um, and of course, like I, I grew up in, in churches and, and everything, but it was, I think while I was in the hospital, I just knew um, I had my uh, grandmother come in and she'll always tell me like, you know, God would only give you as much as you could bear. You know, you're just the strongest person and, you know, he has a plan for you. And so I, I had that faith within myself that, you know, God does, does have a plan for me. I'm living that purpose out every day. That's, that's, that's my gratitude, is that I was able to acknowledge the, the purpose that he gave me. Thank you. And a, a final comment. Thank you so much for sharing yourself, your experiences, and your triumphant new lease on life with us. You have certainly changed my perception of what I believe about inabilities to wonderful new abilities that I can accomplish in this life. I'm framing my world with the words that I speak and believe about my life. God bless you and thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's Siobhan. Rad, because I would like to print that out um, <laughs> and, and make sure that we give Wesley a copy of that last comment. So thanks whoever sent that. And thank you all for coming and being with us today and hearing um, Wesley, uh, I think he left us uh, all touched and our hearts different and our hopes different. Thank you. So thank you. Thanks.